Hey everybody, it's your girl Bunny. It's the CBS All Access original series, Star Trek Picard. Season one, episode two, entitled Maps and Legends. I'll do a recap of the entire episode with photos offset to the side, and I'll also give my review of the episode located in the comments. That's all coming up next. is Bunny. The opening scene takes us to 14 years ago to a shipyard located on Mars. So as the audience, we can know that these are the events that happened in that galactic tragedy located on Mars. As we get closer to the site, we hear an intercom voice which says, Attention all personnel, please be at your designated locations. Happy first contact day. We then see an employee go down the hallway. He gets to a room and he opens up a door and says to synthetics, ah, good morning, plastic people. And in unison, they say, good morning, Mr. Pincus. And the gentleman recognizes that they're all ready and he says, all right, let's get to work. Personnel are going to their different departments and one lady says, you know, everybody else has first contact day off But us I bet everybody else on Mars is having cake and relaxing But look at us. We're working and one of her peers says, you know to work the skeleton shift You have to have a few skeletons So that lets us know that maybe this personnel is on this particular shift for a reason. As they're making small talk, one of the synthetics that has a name of F8 walks in and the personnel tries to catch jokes with him and says, so how was last night? Did you get into any trouble? And he says, well, yes. She says, well, really bad trouble. I'm guessing you got into something. What did you do? He says, well, I don't know. And she says, well, I bet it was a lot of stuff. You got into a lot of trouble. You had a lot of fun, huh? And he looks at her and says, hell yeah. So we can see that they're trying to infuse some sort of humor into the synthetics, making them a little bit more humanesque, being laid back, not so robotic. And as he leaves the room, one of the employees says, you know, they really creep me out. I really can't stand that they're here. And one of them warns, you know they can hear you through the wall, so you might wanna watch what you say. Plus, I know that they can break and tear titanium like it's nothing. And she says, well, I don't care, they creep me out. We then go to a latter part of the day where now they're at their lunch break and they're talking about random things and how the synthetic didn't get some of the jokes that they mentioned earlier in the day and they're still making chit for tit for tat in the room. We then see F8 enter the room and people start to hush a little bit of what they're saying. But as he's giving his commands and as he's typing in certain things into the wall, we can see via a close-up shot of his eyes that seem to have switched what he's doing, his programming. And then he goes to an opposite wall and starts to press in all of these different codings. The personnel looks around and they have this gut feeling that something isn't right. Why is he going to this wall and changing a lot of the digital commands on the wall? And as he's doing that, we hear the intercom confirm synthetic permission, not, not requested, synthetic permissions, not given and they start to see the red light comes on come on and a lot of them are saying oh no like clearly there's an override in this synthetic and they really don't know what to do because as human beings no weapons that they have nothing they can do can beat this synthetic one of the gentlemen they try to attack the synthetic but he snaps his neck like a twig we then see other personnel start to come in but they are having no luck with their weapons after those commands that the synthetic has made into the system, we then see all of the camera footage of ships changing their routes, things starting to explode. So there is major catastrophe that is happening along Mars. After F8 does those commands, he then gets a weapon and he self-destructs himself. <laughs> 
Back at Chateau Picard and Loris, Javan and Picard, they are all looking at the footage in which the explosion happened and they can't find any evidence that Dodge was there. But Picard is reiterating, she was there, she was with me. I don't understand how she's not on the video. I do understand that they can block and they can take out that footage and they can cover themselves in this footage, but why? What is the undertone reason of why Dodge had to feel and she had that instinct to remove herself from the scanners? And Laura says, this has to be Jacques Vache. And Jaban just gives that look like, oh, here we go. And Picard doesn't know what she's speaking of and wants her to reiterate what she's talking about. She says, there's no other explanation. This has to be what it is. That whole premise are lies on top of lies and secrets on top of secrets. And they feel that if it's kept within that, it's like those lies are kept with the dead. They can never be recovered. Romulan culture is very secretive and things that people know they doubt because even that's very secretive. So this has got to be what's going on. Horus emphasizes that we've got to go back to Dasha's apartment. We've got to see if we can scan and get any information because even with the Jacques Vage, maybe there's something that they overlooked. And they start to scan the apartment and she asks Picard, are you sure that she said her boyfriend was murdered here because in all of the things that we're scanning in this room we only see dodge we only see her presence and when we do see her boyfriend it only goes up to a certain point so she thinks about it and she says everything leading up of, until the points where he was murdered had to be not only deleted but completely wiped out Card reminds her that forensic molecular reconstruction is illegal in the Federation. And if the law is broken and that they, if they do that, the research that they obtained is completely dubious. And Laura says, yes, that's what we wanted you to think. And that's the whole point. But there has to be something that's a clue that can let us know that something has been wiped out and we need to find out what that something something is. Was there a time frame in which this information was scanned? So if they start to go back into all of her call logs, who are the outbound calls coming from? going to and the ones that are coming in who are the ones that are calling dodge and they start to go through the files and everything looks like normal calls she has calls going to her mom calls going to which is perceived to be her boyfriend numbers that are repetitive they then say that wow if she's a twin if she ever talked to her other twin you've got to talk to your twin that's your sibling so if we can get an idea of when she's caught that twin, that would help us as well. But Picard says if they're twins, it's highly likely that the computer recognizes that as the same voice. So how are we gonna make a distinction bet between the two? And she says that's a really good point. But even with twins who are identical, there is something slightly different with each one. And the, if the computer recognized that, then it would tweak it and know that those were two different individuals. So they scan and they continue to look and they find a key point to where the computer recognizes that these two distinctions and that these two individuals are totally different and they pinpoint it. And Laura says, here it is. This is this distinction. This is the time frame of when the computer recognized that these are two individual people and to not treat one voice as just Dodge. And she says, what's also interesting is that it's not of this world. It's not on earth. So we're going to have an even harder time trying to figure out where this other twin, twin is and also what planet. Back at the Romulan site, we have Soji and Narek. They're making small talk in the bed. And as the audience, we can know that from episode one, their small talk in the hallway went even further. As they're having pillow talk and having their conversations, he says to her, you know, this Borg cube is nothing short of amazing. It's just wonderful. 
And she says, well, no, the real Borg cube is mighty. It's something that we can't even begin to research. This is just something that's an artifact. And the owners of it are exploiting it and they're exploiting the technology. And then the cherry on the top, they're making profit from it. So he asked her, so I'm guessing that's why you're here. I'm guessing you're here to bring awareness of this exploitation and you're not really a doctor. You're bringing awareness to that and you're secretly taking notes of all of these things. And sarcastically, she says to him, yes, that's why I'm here. I'm not really a doctor. My whole goal is I'm this spy and I'm finding out all of this information to share with everyone else. And she says on top of that, if that's what I'm doing, we've had sex with each other. So then I guess that makes you an accessory. So we're both guilty letting him know that, hey, if that's really what I'm about, we're in this together. So now we are clean and we now we are together in this so-called plan that I have. And she says, you know, I know that you're very secretive and it's nothing you can tell me, but is there anything you can share with me about yourself? And he says, yes. I can tell you that I'm a very private person. She huffs and puffs as she gets her clothes back on, ready to go about her day. And she says, I just hope that at least that's your real name. Is that your real name? And he says, well, I guess so. It's one of them. Bard meets with the character who Trekkies are pretty much aware of, and he meets with Maurice. And Maurice is the doctor that served with Picard on Stargazer. And when he arrives, they share an endearing hug between friends. And as soon as the smile is given, it's quickly taking, taken away. And Picard can see the tone in his face, his body language, and he says, just tell me what it is. I really wanted you to be here in order to clear me for intergalactic service. I need to know if you can clear that for me. And Maritz tells him, we've got to sit down and we've got to talk about what I found. You're healthy. Looking at it, at it from a perspective of if you, want, if you wanted to serve in different things is great. But what you're talking about, the service that you want to get into, you're not ready for that. You know what's going on, for, on with you. This is nothing new. And what he was referring to is when the doctor told him in one of the TNG um, series was that he had a, I think it's a something going on with his parietal lobe. And this is not anything new because Picard has heard that before and he says you lost appetite not being able to sleep this is not something that you want to take with you into space you are at a point where that could cause more danger in the long run and i'm letting you know now that whatever you choose to do you're taking that with you and you have a very high possibility in this taking control of you and taking your life than anything else that's going on in the galaxy or out of space. Card goes to the Starfleet headquarters and he's dressed and we can tell that he's going to meet someone really important. He goes to the front desk and when he reaches the front desk, he sees the original Starfleet and he's looking around and he gets to the front desk and he's waiting on the gentleman at the front desk to greet him and he says, well, hello, sir. And he says, well, hello. And the gentleman says, well, are you here to meet someone? He's like, yes, I actually have a meeting. And the gentleman working there says, and your name, sir? And Picard has this look like, you don't know who I am, really? <laughs> and it's this comical moment, not thinking of the age gap and this young guy at the counter really not knowing who he is. And Picard gives his name and he's just like, Picard, P-I-C-A-R-D. Like, I can't believe this guy doesn't know who I am. And the guy taps it in and he looks at his name and he says, oh yes, you have, you have um, an, a, a meeting coming up. Yes, sir. And he hands him the visitor's badge and Picard is just like, ugh, like, I can't believe you don't know who I am. And he slaps on the visitor's badge in disgust. Picard enters the office where we see Kirsten. And if you're a Trekkie, you know that Picard and Miss Kirsten, they have had some bad blood in the past and they do not get along. And she has a very stern face on and she says, Picard, yes, let me help you. And he sits down and he has this energy and he immediately says, okay, look, 
I know that you and I have not seen eye to eye in the past, but what I have to say is really important. Bruce Maddox, I believe that he's using neurons and he's creating synthetics. She goes, really? And he says, yes, and, and I think that Romulans are involved. And she says, oh, and this just keeps getting better and better. And he says, okay, this is what's going on. I know we don't get along, but th this is what I need. I need you to reinstate me. I need you to temporarily reinstate me. We've got to investigate this. I need a ship, a minimal crew. Um, and, and you know, and this is so important that you can even demote me to captain because it's something that we can't overlook here. And then she drops a line where she basically says unbelievable but there's an f-bomb that's inserted in there and a lot of trekkies were upset about that because star trek doesn't have any vulgarity in it but she dropped the f-bomb in the episode and she says the nerve of you to come in here not only as being a ghost for many years and leaving Starfleet, but you pop back up and you have all of these demands. You want a ship, you want a crew, and then you have the nerve to say, and you can even demote me to be captain after you got the Federation involved to help one of its known enemies to be rescued. And then we used all of our resources to help do you know that people that were along with the Federation, over 14 different species were going to back out of the Federation if we helped them? That put us at risk. We had to keep the peace with them. So you just created all of these things. We backed out because we were using all of our resources to help an enemy. And Picard says, we were trying to save lives. You're not thinking of the lives. And who are we as the Federation to say what species we can save. We have no say over what species to save and which ones to not. And she says, yes, we do. And Picard has this look like, wow, how evil of you to say. And she says with him with great firmness, this is no longer your house. This is no longer your place. Keep doing what you're doing and stay away and stay at home and do nothing. Your job is to stay out of this. Let us do our job. And as a matter of fact, your request is denied. And when I tell you Picard shot out of that room and went down that escalator, woo, you could see the steam coming out of his ears because Miss Kirsten was not having it. Soji is gearing up to get ready to go to one of her research locations and she's putting on uniform. And then she sees across the room, another young lady who's very, who's clearly very, very nervous. And she can't even get her research outfit on correctly. And so she says, let me help you out. And the other lady is just like, this is so embarrassing, but thank you for helping me. She's like, no, really just stay calm. I know it can be nerve wracking. You feel like every turn is dangerous, but you'll be just fine. And she says, I just, this whole situation and how I got here is just really weird. I was supposed to be here six months ago. And then when I got halfway here, then they declined it. And then they turned back around and gave me permission again. So now I'm here and I'm just really, really nervous. And so it just says, it's okay. Just remain calm. Remember your practices for your research and you'll be just fine. Make sure that you wear your badge. Make sure that you watch it. Watch it. Don't go into any of the gray areas or the gray zones. Do not have have this on when you go into research the research area stay calm you got this I was nervous when I first got here but everything will be okay so they immediately bond because they seem to share this research um, interest into the cube and what they're about to do so they kind of cling together as new friends they enter into the loading zone we see other employees other researchers start to gather together to hear all of the instructions before they go forward and soji leans to her and says just a fair warning the romulan are very dramatic so then we see a guy get at the top of the loading zones and he takes a deep breath and he says you are about to listen to your instructions before entering into the zone. Remember that you are about to enter one of the most destructive weapons ever known. Even though it is inactive, there are still potential dangers. If you go into an area and your badge starts to blink green, run. Across the room, we notice that Narek is looking and she says, wow, I never knew that Romulan were so hot. 
And Soji gives a smirk and says, I didn't think so either. I didn't know that. And they get closer about until they're about to go into the research area. And he says, oh, hi, Narc, this is, and before she can even introduce her new friend, he says, oh, yes, this is Dr. Nahashna welcome and she's very surprised that he even knows her name so as a viewer we can go hmm clearly he's been doing his research about people that haven't even got here yet red flag big easter egg dropped so he says yes i'm very intrigued by a lot of your research and dr nahashna says do you think of the potential dangers of people dropping here and observing the board? Do you not feel that there should be limitations and fields about who can research and who can step on this? And Soji says, well, no, this, this board is inactive and there's nothing happening here that we're not aware of. And Narek says, yeah, it's pretty much a graveyard. Anybody that's coming here to do research, there's only so many things that can become activated and there's nothing that you have to worry about. Dr. Nahashina walks off and she seems confirmed into what he's saying. And he asks Soji, you know, do you think I can go with you into your research area just to take a few notes and watch what you do? She says, well, that type of access requires certification and it requires that somebody confirm it that you do watch. So she kind of gives this kind of sarcastic no, pretty much thinking that he can't have access. And as she walks off, he has this smirky look and says, actually, I don't. Letting us know that he doesn't need any permission to go to any of those high regulated places. Agnes meets with Picard and she wants to meet with him to go further into depth to speak about Dodge. And when she's there, he asked her, is anything I can get you to drink? And she says, mm, I'll take a little bit of Earl Grey. And Picard says, I knew that there was something special about you because we all know how Picard loves his Earl Grey tea. And she sits down and she says, the further research that I did, that this Dodge didn't even exist, but for three years ago. So the fact that she got into the Institute, the fact that she was at school, lets me know that she was created. And not only created, but she was brought into a situation on purpose. How is it that she was created three years ago, but we have all of these false subtleties as if she's been here all along and if she's been here all along where has she been existing where has she been so-called hiding where was her existence and Picard says yes this is very unique and this is why it's so important that I must find out what is going on with this Dodge and why are there so many lies to cover up certain things that we know about her so they share a little bit more in depth of conversation and wondering what is this mystery about this so-called called synthetic that wasn't supposed to exist and existing but even replic replicating human flesh. Picard is in his study. He's at his desk. He's gazing at the clock. We see as the audience it's 9 p.m. So he's gone the whole day deep in thought thinking about what he's going to do. He goes into his drawer. He pulls out that special pendant that we know he thinks about it. He then goes to the front door and gazes into the sky and looks at the stars, kind of waiting on something to give him a sign of the decision that he's making. What he's about to walk into is the correct thing. Because you have to remember, he's been retired. He's been out of the swing of things for a moment. He's questioning, wow, I do have my diagnosis from the doctor, do I need to think about that? So we see the conflict, conflicting thoughts through his facial expressions. But then he finally looks at the ground. He straightens up his back. He puts on the pendant and he says, Ralphie, oh, no, 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 don't hang up. I need a ship. Kirsten makes a call to Commodore and it's about Bruce Maddox and the synthetics. He tells her Picard came in here you know, after he's been gone and a ghost and after he quit. But he reiterates that he thinks it's important that we have to investigate this, that there could be some situation where Romulans are going into this research and it's being hidden. I think we should look into it, but I, I don't know why he would bring that up. It's just such a topic of why would he make that up and just think this was just important all of, the, all of the sudden. And Commodore tells her, you know, if there were even something, just a salt grain of that going on, 
I would know, then you would know, and then the Federation would know. So I wouldn't worry yourself about this. We are going to keep an eye on Picard. We need to make sure that he's not doing anything that he doesn't need to do and ruffling up feathers and causing a ruckus and causing panic. So it's not something that you need to think about. Why don't we just keep an eye on him? We make sure that he stays subtle where he needs to be in retirement. And I'll let you know if I hear anything and they end the call. It's very distinctive is that after the call, Commodore request Lieutenant Rizzo. First breaks a ton of dishes when she finds out that Picard wants to go back into it. And she's like, are you insane? Do you not realize that, that, that you're older and you're putting yourself in danger? You've already done a lot. You've done so much to help people. Why do you want to go back into space? And Javon doesn't seem like he's kind of against it. He's kind of encouraging it. And Laura says, you've got to be insane to want to do that again. Why not just be safe and stay at home? Look at what you're doing around here. Why are you even considering it? And Picard tells her, look, I know it's insane. I know it's crazy, but look, has, look what happened. We got randomly this person that shows up, says that she needs our help. We start to look into it. Attackers come out of nowhere, kill her boyfriend, kill her, and we're just supposed to let that just slide? We're supposed to let, just let that go? No, we've got to research this. Loris is not having it. She says, look, when you come to your senses, then we can talk. She leaves the room and Javon says, you know, um, I get what she's saying and you got to understand where she's coming from. She wants you to be safe. You have a risk of death here because you're talking about going into territory and not even that, stuff that has stuff to do with Romulans. But if you're going to do it, um, can't go by yourself. Why don't you call, you know, Worf, Riker, LaForge? <laughs> and when he's saying the names, I'm like, yes, yes, call them. <laughs> but Picard, being Picard, he's like, no, who you mentioned, I know I would call them and they would say yes in a heartbeat. That's the problem. I don't want to put their lives at risk. And they would say yes, because they have loyalty to me. I don't want to put their lives at risk anymore. I just can't do it. So Jabon says, okay, well, you need somebody who, you, who hates you and can't stand you. And Picard says, I've already made a call. Oh! Rizzo appears, I, I was so close to saying Rizza because I'm doing the Wu-Tang Clan stuff. I'm like Rizza Jizza, <laughs> Lieutenant <laughs> Lizzo Rizzo. <laughs> I'm sorry, but Rizzo arrives at Commodore's office and Commodore has a display of footage and she says, does this look like destructive fire to you? She says, well, no. She says, here on the handle rail, does this look like destructive fire to you? And Rizzo says, no, it, it doesn't look that way. She says, well, you know what? Picard had this information about cladescent cl ops, and he even mentioned this to Admiral Clamsey. So this isn't good. We have Picard looking into this, letting her know, this is not just anybody talking about this information. And she says, well, I, I don't know. But she says, no, 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 I'll tell you. You and I in this mi mission, with you and your explosion, you could have exposed us all and blew our covers with what we're trying to do. Get it together. And I know he didn't mention that it was Jadvaj, but that's what it is. And Rizzo says, well, how do you know that he mentioned that and that's what it is? And, and you know, Commodore gives her that look like, Girl, you better not insult my intelligence because clearly if he's gotten this far and he knows this information, it's obvious that he knows something. And she says, look, the person that you have on the inside helping us, well, we have people on both sides of the fence researching and trying to get the information that we need. Your explosion killed the being that we need. It was damaged and died before we could even research it. So I'm gonna warn you again. You better get the information that we need or you're gonna have me to deal with. And then we're gonna to have to do things my way. So she tells her, you only got one more chance to get this right. Talk to your contact, 
let them know what they've report to you what they've just figured out and all of the information that they have and you report that back to me but in the meantime get out of my office and make sure that you handle this right because you almost blew our covers and you almost blew up what we were trying to do Hard gets off of a taxi he goes to a particular site where a woman is on her porch and she pulls out a gun and says <laughs> You better turn around and go exactly where you came from. And don't you ever think about coming back. And he says, well, I, she says, no, 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 no. You need to leave. He says, okay, but secret Romulan assassins are here on earth. He starts to walk away. She gives this long sigh. <sighs> Is that the 86? And he pulls it over his back to where she can see the wine. She says, oh, like, oh, Picard, what do you have me getting into now? See Lizzo, she visits Narek at his location via hologram. And we know immediately that he is the villain that we thought him to be. And she says, what research have you come up on? Commodore just told me that we're reaching a point where we've got to tell her the information that we know right now. What do you have? Do you have any research? I see that you've been busy, clearly. But what do you have to report back? And he says, you know, I'm trying my best. I, I best, I'm working at getting the information that I need. And she says, no, 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 no. We are running out of time. You're tiptoeing and you're taking your time with this. And he says, look at you with those ears. So we know that Lizzo is disguising herself as Vulcan when she's truly Romulan. And she says, I'm doing my best to stay calm, but you need to speed things up because our research and everything that, we, that we've been working on could be compromised. So hurry up. And I would do other things and I would say other things, but because you're my brother, I won't do those things. So make sure you put some pep in your step and get the information that we need. We don't need any clues that we're here trying to get what we need. And we automatically know as the audience, their goal is to get to Soji. Their goal is to make sure to capture her for research purposes. And that is the end of the episode. Make sure to check the comments for my review and key points. And also make sure to follow me on Instagram at the same profile name, officialbun underscore E. And I don't know if you noticed, but I subscribe to whomever subscribes to me. Check out more videos and those playlists and other shows that you're missing out on. I make sure to go over every single episode with recaps as well with pictures offset to the side. Check out Watchmen, check out Wu-Tang and American Saga and so much more. Thank you for tuning in. That's it. See you for episode three. Bye. <laughs>